Good evening and welcome to the uh, June 21st regular meeting of the Manhattan City Commission. Uh, if you would join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, the first item on the agenda this evening is uh, the Pollinator Week proclamation. And there are several uh, folks here on my list. I see Alfonso, yeah, Alfonso Le Leva, yeah, if I say it right, Melissa Kirkwood and Jared Bixby. And Melissa and Jared are from the Man Sunset Zoo. and. Uh, Alfonso is from the uh, planning office. Okay, part what? Parks on Rec. Okay, if you join me at the microphone. Uh -huh. I just want to be sure I get your names loud on the microphone <laughs> because sometimes we fade as we move around up here. Um, so whereas the week of June 20th to the 26th is National Pollinator Week and pollinator species such as honeybees, native bees, birds, bats, and butterflies are essential partners of farmers and ranchers in producing much of our food supply. And pollinator species provide significant environmental benefits that are necessary for maintaining healthy, biodiverse ecosystems. It is critically important to encourage the protection of pollinators, increase the quality and amount of pollinator habitat and forage, reverse pollinator losses, and help restore pollinator <clears throat> populations to healthy levels. Sunset Zoo, Flint Hills Discovery Center, and the Parks Division continue to work together with local organizations for the benefit of our pollinators and community. And the City of Manhattan Parks and Recreation Department has a pollinator initiative in our park system in an effort to support our local ecosystem. Now, therefore, in recognition of the vital st significance of protecting pollinator health, I, Linda Morse, Mayor of the City of Manhattan, <clears throat> do hereby proclaim June 20th to the 26th as Pollinator Week in the City of Manhattan and ask the people of Manhattan to join me in recognizing the importance of pollinator species and protecting pollinators <clears throat> and maintaining their habitats to ensure healthy ecosystems and food security. Thank you, Mayor, for uh, uh, helping us acknowledge Pollinator Week. Um, also, uh, helping us, uh, uh, um, you know, let the community know that we are uh, uh, moving forward and, and uh, for the foreseeable future to work with the uh, uh, our pollinator uh, park, uh, our pollinator pockets within our uh, uh, park system, and then also uh, the relationships we're building within the uh, within the community with. Uh, not only within our own, our own department, but also uh, across the city and, and region. Um, and with that, I'd like to uh, pass over to Melissa with a little bit more. Thank you, Alfonso. Um, with Sunset Zoo, we're very happy to be partners with not only our own Parks and Recreation Department, but we um, strongly partner with others in the community. Um, K-State's um, Extension Office is here tonight. Um, we work with them quite a bit with our gardens in our own zoo. And there's other uh, garden groups that we work with as well. If you have not been on a garden tour with K-State, it is this Saturday, so please go visit a, a local garden. Um, I'm sure you'll see some pollinators there. We have many pollinators at Sunset Zoo, and um, we have pollinator gardens. We have butterflies and birds and some bees and some beehives and we produce our own local honey as part of some of our conservation efforts. Um, something that we're very proud of to extend our partnerships this year with the Association of Zoos and Aquariums we were awarded a grant to help with pollinator education and we are building three pollinator gardens with three of our local 
um, elementary schools. That has just now started, but we're very proud to partner with Marlette Bergman and Oliver Brown. So um, we want to keep this mission going, and we're super happy that it is part of our mission at Sunset Zoo. It doesn't sound like a really expensive thing. <laughs> It sounds like a wonderful program, and you're introducing concepts to students who would never have thought about it and know the consequences. Did you want to speak too, Jared? Okay. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you. you Mayor. Thank you all. Just to say, I really like short proclamations. <laughs> Sometimes they come short. Uh, thank you. I appreciate you coming this evening and, and your emphasis on Pollinator Week. Uh, next on the agenda is Commissioner Comments. If you would like to comment, Mark, how about you? Okay. There's just one comment. I, I really like this pollinator program. My, my wife helps at the zoo doing the butterfly garden, but just so everybody knows out there, I got some complaints, people saying, gee, you know, Parks isn't mowing this little section, and that's the pollinator pockets, you know, that are out there in some of our parks, which saves us mowing, but, you know, it's there to get the butterflies and the monarchs in there. I think we are a monarch city, you know, also, so hopefully we'll get a bunch of them this year. You should. Yes, I just wanted to say um, Adabus has their new fixed route systems up on their website. So if you're interested in seeing where the new stops are or if you need to find the old stops or if you want to use Adabus, please feel free to go to their website and check it out. And I also want to commend um, the Riley County Police Department. We've been working, you know, we've had co-responders at the several years ago we started the co-responder program and ever since then we've been in conversation for the uh, crisis intervention teams and they were finally able to get it up and going and because of the pandemic originally with the training was supposed to start much earlier and you can't have this training online it has to be in person so I'm really proud of uh, how far we've come and how far RCPD has come as well it involves a lot of community members a lot of commitment and dedication we have a lot of individuals living with mental illness and this, uh, this doesn't fall, the whole entire responsibility will not fall just on co-responders. It'll be where uh, our RCPD police officers are involved in the training, as well as awareness and education for the community. So I just want to let you know that we are heading in the right direction, and I really applaud uh, our PD. Thank you. Um, I've... I would just like to, one of the things that I think is especially fun is the air guitar uh, e event that occurred here in the community. There's another one, I think it's September 15th. You might look for the, the actual, I think it's that date. But it's going to be on Points Avenue, so it's going to be outside, so the, so the number of people attending won't be as limited as it was when it was at the Wareham. So, you know, look for opportunities to do fun things, too, and uh, that it would be fun, watching air guitar. <laughs> there are lots of other events um, that are taking place, um, but I think in the interest, I'll just get the meeting going, and we'll... Uh, find out about them as time goes on. So next item on the agenda would be the consent agenda. And these are the items uh, that are of a routine and housekeeping nature or those items which have been previously reviewed by the City Commission. A commissioner may request an item be moved to the end of the general agenda for more discussion. Uh, does the commission have any questions or comments on any of the consent agenda items? Yeah, I just wanted to confirm, you know, item Jesus, this uh, Farm and Food Council plan, and I, I think city staff recommended some changes to that. Did they get put in there? They did. Yes, okay. Just wanted to confirm that, and, and this does not involve any funding from the city at all. That's correct. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there, uh, at this point, we would, uh, assuming the commission is through, we would accept um, public comment on the consent agenda or items on the consent agenda. Um, does anyone want to come forward? 
I have a big long paragraph I have to read if there are a lot of you. <laughs> but it, it appears there, there, there are no takers on public comment, so I'll close the public comment period. Um, Mayor, I move that we approve the consent agenda. Okay. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. Would Brenda Wolf, the city clerk, would you call the roll? Mayor Morse? Yes. Commissioner Hassel? Yes. Commissioner Reddy? Yes. Commissioner Butler? Yes. Commissioner Mata? Yes. Motion carries five to zero. Okay. Next we have the general agenda. And it, the first item is to consider a reading of an ordinance rezoning 1550 Jarvis Drive uh, from uh, RL Low Density Residential to RLU or OUF Low Density Residential with University Fringe Overlay. And Stephanie, I'm as Stephanie Peterson, Director of Community Development. I'm happy to turn that one over to you. <laughs> it you, says Mary Beagle is going to speak, but obviously. <laughs> I, I decided I should probably make okay. my first All presentation right. to y'all sooner oh, than later. You. Okay. So. It was this or the annexation. And you have to speak uh, one one mic or the other, but if you speak in the middle, it cancels it out. Nobody at home can hear and nobody in the room, so thank you All for right. picking one. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, Stephanie Peterson, Director of Community Development, uh, as the mayor had said. Um, hopefully this evening we have a pretty straightforward rezoning um, case before you. Um, this is for the rezoning at 1550 Jarvis Drive from low density residential um, to low density residential with a university fringe overlay. The property owners, uh, Chuck and Lisa Dodd, they currently operate a nonprofit campus ministry um, on the property, which is permitted as an accessory home office. However, they are wanting to partner with Helping International Students LLC, who is the applicant. Um, they provide a very similar service to international students from K-State. Uh, however, in order to do that, they need to um, have the university, over, the university fringe overlay um, applied to the zoning, and, which would permit the institutional office use for the Helping International Students LLC to operate on the property. This did go before the Manhattan Urban Area Planning Board on June 6th. Um, and they recommended approval of the rezoning. It also went before the Board of Zoning Appeals on June 8th and received a conditional use permit for institutional office use. Uh, there is the general location of the property uh, in the center of town near the university. <coughs> and looking a bit closer, um, you can see that it truly does about the Jardine student housing, um, which is primarily the audience that they serve. And then looking at the zoning map, it is surrounded on two sides by the university. Um, and there are other areas, um, in, or there's other properties within the area that also have that university fringe overlay district as well. I, that's really um, all I had presented. Um, as I mentioned, I think it's pretty straightforward, but I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. I do have a question if uh, because the Board of Zoning Appeals supports the zoning change the conditional conditional use, use. okay yes. um, in the future if this ceases to be used for this purpose does it revert back does it always stay what it, what happens to it so this the <clears throat> zoning would stay this it would zoning stay as applied. yes okay um, the conditional use permit I might have to ask John um, but if it could stay, or if it's attached with the property owner. It can't stay. It cannot stay. It cannot stay. Okay. I just wondered, because we are making an exception, and I'm wondering what it could be converted to. And I know, I drove by, and it looks like a new structure. And that is, we're supposed to get these approvals prior to construction, is my uh, expectation. So I wondered if we, didn't notice it or they didn't come or what's the story so right now the property owners are actually using the structure they have a meeting space in there where yeah. international students are able to come and congregate mm -hmm. um, and that is allowed under the zoning district right okay. now right. Um, as an accessory home office the issue becomes when somebody other than the property owners is wanting to have to utilize that space okay that is when it kind of turns over to being a institutional office uh -huh. rather than a, an accessory home office okay so if it was the property 
property owners that were wanting to continue to use it, we would mm -hmm. have no issues. Okay. The fact that they're wanting to partner with another organization, it's what is what, triggering that. Okay. Yep. All right. I appreciate that explanation. You're so I, I have a couple of questions also. Uh, when we did the MDC, one of the things that came up were accessory dwellings. This is accessory use. So when we speak of access, accessory dwellings, is that like if somebody has a home and they want to build something extra where people live it as would opposed to detached, or detached. yeah this yeah exactly but it would be when we say accessory use and accessory dwelling I guess is what I'm looking to see the difference between the two words the accessory dwelling uh, refers to a second structure the use is an additional use so this on is an accessory dwelling which is being used no it's an accessory use Okay. Um, so it's actually the language is an accessory home office. Right. Um, so the the primary intent of this uh, home it, it's a residential single family residential home. The app or the owners also have a business that they run out of it. So it's the same structure. So it's not an accessory dwelling. It's an accessory use, but they're running out to somebody else. So if the, it says here that it's already in our MDC. Uh, both of those. So I was wondering why it had to go to the Board of Zoning Appeals, why the planning board didn't, because one of the things we wanted to do is reduce the going to the Boarding of Zoning Appeals. So was there um, a reason it had to go? It seems like it would have been just with the planning board that they would have been able to do both. So the Board of Zoning Appeals is what heard the conditional use permit. A conditional use permit was needed because this wasn't a permitted use under the University Fringe overlay. It was a, it could be um, operated this way under a conditional use. So it had, uh, as the MDC, I guess, describes it, it's only a limited use. And so it goes before the BZA to set forth further conditions um, in order for them to operate okay. as this institutional office. So would this have been the same even if we didn't have the MDC codes? Correct, yes. Okay. That's what I wanted to know because I was I was hoping this would have uh, re the MDC codes would have reduced some of that. Otherwise, it seems like it would have been the same process um, as far as the usage and, and things of that sort. Because one of the things we want to do is reduce the load. The board of conditional uses and conditional permits is what we were trying to reduce. But it seems like we have not been able to do that. At least not in this situation. I would say yes, not in this situation, but I think in other situations we have found that the MDC has allowed for a little bit more, um, uh, I don't know the word, we don't have to go in front of the Board of Zoning Appeals as much anymore. And that's something I think we'll continue to see in the coming future. Um, but there are certain situations where we still want to make sure that the, um, like with this institutional office, that it is going before the BZA in order to set any other parameters that they have to follow rather than just the MDC says it's allowed or not allowed. This can set further restrictions on how that's used. And is there rent being paid on this? Or I don't know if that matters, if it's being I used don't, for anything? Yeah, okay, I, don't I wasn't sure how all of it. If it's a business, like if somebody wanted to use it as a rental space or a party place or whatever it might be, I don't know how all of that works into that. It's just two charities working together. Exactly. Yes. I just and meant in the future. People yeah. gathering there the for the same use. It's just two right. organizations partnering. Yeah. There. No, I understand how they're going to be used. I was wondering when Commissioner Morris brought up that if if other people wanted to use it in a different manner. Um, so either way, that's for a future discussion. Thank you. I I just wanted to confirm that there was no other condition. Uh, no other. Uh, factor being considered by the Board of Zoning Appeals. It was only the uh, use there, but it didn't infringe into either uh, setbacks or right of way. No. Okay. Uh, the structure Thanks. is not being altered in yeah. any way. It just looks bigger than, or longer than whatever would have been there before. So maybe it was allowed earlier, but it didn't fill the whole space. Okay. Thank you very much. Welcome. Any other questions? <clears throat> okay. Um, uh, we'll now have public comment on this item. Uh, does anyone care to comment? If you'd come forward, please, and state your name and address. I'm Terrence Cole. I'm okay. the director of Helping International Students. Okay. And I live at uh, 5212 McLeod Drive 
here in Manhattan. And I would just like to thank your, you for your consideration, uh, the planning board and the zoning board for their consideration on this. Um, you know, we've been around since 1979, and of course, international students have been coming to K-State and Manhattan long before that. And almost all of them arrive with just a suitcase um, and a bunch of dreams and little else. And what we do is welcome them here. We pick them up at the airport. We take them to their apartments. We store furniture throughout the year and give it to them free to furnish their apartments. And we supply welcome dinners and friendships uh, for them so they, they can get accustomed uh, to Manhattan so that they can feel like their apartment is their new home. So again, I just want to thank you for consideration. I did want to bring up one thing. We do have to move the shed. There is a shed that does infringe on the uh, area. So until, until we move that, we cannot use it as a, and put in a type A buffer. So uh, until we do that, um, we cannot use it as a office. Oh, I don't yeah. think we know what all that means. So. Okay. <laughs> we'll need <laughs> an official you. interpretation over here. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Appreciate it, Terry. Okay. Um, what do we do? We do anything with the new information or just go forward and it'll have to be reconsidered as another project? No. And, no, okay. it's not related to the rezoning. Okay. That's the answer. Thank you very much, John. All right. Is there any other public comment this evening on the proposal? Okay. Um, do commissioners have questions? Mm -hmm. Mayor, I move that we approve first reading of an ordinance rezoning 50, 1550 Jarvis Drive from RL Low Density Residential to RLO UF Low Density Residential with University Fringe Overlay District based on the findings in the staff report. I'll second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Brenda Wolf, would you, City Clerk, would you call the roll? Commissioner Hannesall? Yes. Commissioner Reddy? Yes. Yes. Commissioner Butler? Yes. Commissioner Mata? Yes. Mayor Morse? Yes. Motion carries 5 to 0. Okay. Hope that wasn't painful. <laughs> it's just a process we have to go through. All right, the next item B is to consider a request for annexation from the owners of the proposed MCM Industrial Park along with resolution number 062122-A requesting the board uh, of County Commissioners of Pottawatomie County make certain findings concerning the annexation. And the presenter this evening is John Adams, Senior Planner. Uh, good evening, Mayor and members of the Commission. Uh, John Adams, Senior Planner. Uh, before you tonight is an island annexation that was initiated through a consent to annex by the property owner. State statute requires that the city pass a resolution finding it advisable for the city to annex and asking the Board of County Commissioners to find that it won't hinder or prevent the proper growth and development of the area or any other, any other incorporated city in the county. In April, the City Commission approved a resolution declaring its intent to support the location of Scorpion Biological Services through industrial revenue bonds and economic development incentives. The staff memo uh, contains findings in support of the annexation. I'll be summarizing those tonight in my presentation. If the commission approves a resolution, these are next steps, and the Board of City or, or County Commissioners makes its findings in favor, the next step for the City Commission will be to consider an annexation or an ordinance to annex the land. Uh, this area is at the northeast corner of Highway 24 and Excel Road. It's 50 and a half acres roughly and includes the full right of way of Excel Road that's adjacent to it. Here it is in context of the lot lines. You can see that there's already a platted subdivision in the southern portion with a street right of way. Nothing was ever developed there. Uh, that plat is going to be vacated. My understanding was that that process has probably already started. Uh, the city has anticipated growth in this area for some time. In 2015, working with Pottawatomie County, we developed a future land use plan map that you are seeing here. Um, the area is shown as service commercial on the future land use map. That corresponds exactly with the requested zoning designation 
uh, Industrial Service Commercial, or ICS. The proposed use of the property is a pharmaceutical manufactory, a use that is classified as general manufacturing and fabrication in the city's development code, which is an outright permitted use in the ICS district. Blue Township master, Sewer Master Plan was developed with the land uses from our 2015 comprehensive plan to model future system needs. There is an 18-inch sewer main running down Excel Road that can provide service to the site. The master plan does not show a need to upsize this sewer main in the future. There will be a need to put in an extension along the highway in the future to handle the residential growth to the north and northeast of this location. But that's not related to this. In addition to adequate sewer service already existing, the city also provides water service through an interlocal agreement with the Rural Water District. Access management would be regulated or will be regulated at the time of platting and development, but I will note that the plan is for Scorpion to take its access off of Excel Road and, and or to build a street at the north end of the property. Uh, that will eventually run east-west over to Lake Elbow Road and provide access to the lots east of this site, thereby keeping access points off of the highway. The traffic impacts, impact study by the applicant contains highway corridor improvement recommendations. That TIS is being reviewed by city and county staff and by KDOT. Among its recommendations is signalization at 24 and Excel and dual left turn lanes on that highway for northbound trips onto Excel. Stormwater detention, if necessary, would be determined at time of development, although there is a detention pond that is adjacent to the site that was designed to, um, to serve a large part of the watershed. The 2009 corridor management plan developed by KDOT also recommended uh, raising the ground level of the site to improve drainage along the highway and its ditches. The landowner has already been doing some of that work. Before you leave that, it looks like there are some lots uh, drawn on the south part of the uh, Scorpion project. Is that and an access road? That is that plat that was done several years ago that will be vacated. Okay, so it'll vacated. be re there'll be a new development plan. That's correct. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. That um, you probably saw in the packet that in, yeah. in the resolution. That's that why I was surprised to see that. Okay, thank yes, you. Yes, that's, that's that this is not right of way within the area. That'll thank be. you. Yes. Okay. Uh, Look again, impacts. Uh, the annexation is two and three quarters miles uh, from the St. George Urban Impact Area, which is a definition or term that was defined in the Pottawatomie County Comprehensive Plan. And it's three and a half miles from the St. George city limits. So it's not likely to impact the growth or development of St. George. The site is one mile from the Heritage Square developed, development. That's another island that's in the city limits of Manhattan um, and the area the MCM area is roughly two miles if you measure along the highway from the contiguous city limits at the Blue River. In every respect, this annexation proposal is appropriate for the city of Manhattan. The proposed zoning follows the future land use plan and existing city services have already, been, have already made it a de facto part of the urban service area. So city staff is recommending that the city commission find that the annexation of the MCM industrial park into the Manhattan city limits is advisable and approve the resolution requesting the board of county commissioners of Pot Pottawatomie County, County to find that the proposed annexation will not hinder or prevent the proper growth and development of the area or of any other incorporated city located within Pottawatomie County. The resolution also requests the BOC the Board of County Commissioners consent to the annexation of designated county right-of-way located within and adjacent to the MCM Industrial Park. And I'd be happy to take any questions. And we are following the state statute, right? That is correct. Uh -huh. And so the next step, so the next step is for the count, uh, Pottawatomie County Commissioners to consider it and hopefully approve it. What is the step after that? The step after that would be um, <clears throat> once they have approved it, we can bring it to you for an ordinance to annex the property. Okay. Um, I appreciate your presentation, John. Thank you. Sure. Uh, at this point, we are ready to receive, uh, unless. I have a question. Yes, please. Yeah, I think uh, it's such a large area that we're 
thinking about annexing this evening. But I also want to know the impact or if we have any feedback from uh, about regarding fire and RCPD and what that entails as far as infrastructure or needs in that area. Um, briefly, I can say that this, the building of this structure, of this uh, plant, would likely require that we locate a fire station out there uh, in order to serve it immediately. I don't know about RCPD, so I would defer to other members of staff. So with regard to law enforcement, uh, any area that becomes part of the city, obviously the RCPD is uh, charged with enforcing the laws and ordinances of the city, so uh, currently they patrol the area and enforce those ordinances in heritage. It would be similar to this tract. It's a little bit unusual, but it would uh, include the right-of-way uh, from that particular area, so the rest is all private property, so I don't see any uh, uh, encumbrances there from, from that standpoint. And on the fire side, uh, uh, ultimately it'll be uh, uh, in the best interest of the uh, entity that uh, ultimately we provide additional fire services there. It's currently uh, beyond our normal fire uh, range for response by the uh, secondary units, so it, it would be something that we would need to locate a fire station to serve this area. Sure, thank you, and it'd be interesting to know how much more PD staff might be needed, but if the, if the annexation and um, the building structure are there, I'm sure we'll figure all of that out as well. Thanks. Do other commissioners have questions, comments? All right. Um, we'll now receive public comments uh, on this item. If you didn't sign up in advance, please be sure to write your name and address on the sign-up sheet at the podium. Um, you have five minutes. We want to hear what your comments from you. Um, but let's see. So does anyone have comments? If you'd come forward, please. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, Jason Smith, Manhattan Area Chamber of Commerce, 904 Lacharno. Um, here for the first of what I would anticipate will be many appearances in regards to Scorpion Biologics. Uh, Darren and I may rotate so you don't get tired of seeing one of us. But uh, um, just wanted to briefly uh, talk about uh, the project, how we got to this point. Um, there's a few things that I think are worth pointing out. But before we do that, I think it's important to uh, thank uh, the Eichmann's because they've done a lot of work to get this ready in a, in a very fast manner in order to, uh, to make it available for this project. And I also want to uh, thank the staff of both uh, the Chamber's Economic Development Team as well as the city staff because this is not the normal way we do projects uh, and there has been a lot of extra work in this process and everybody that has touched it has, in what I have witnessed, has done an incredible job. This presentation was outstanding. The memo that, that uh, Stephanie did was was uh, remarkable. And so uh, I think it's important to, to recognize that and uh, understand that that none of this happens if, if those folks don't get, get their work done. So I appreciate that. Um, one of the questions that I get as part of this project is why did we not find a site that was already in the city limits? And, and the answer to that is there isn't one. Uh, there is not a site in the city limits that would have been able to accommodate this project. When they first did their 27 state search, the facility was much smaller. And when they asked for uh, sites and that uh, might accommodate that, we did have one. But since that time, the site is two and a half times larger than they initially envisioned, which necessitated a much larger site. Uh, it would have been much easier, obviously, to have had a site ready within the city limits, but that wasn't feasible. Quite frankly, it's remarkable that we were able to land the project with this sort of um, uh, issue still left to be done, but I think that's a testament to um, Scorpion's team and, and, um, and now Nighthawk Biologics team and their, um, their view on Manhattan and how much they love this community and, and appreciated the partnerships they had with the city and the chamber in Kansas State, uh, and so uh, we're very appreciative of that. But uh, obviously it would have been easier if it had been the city limits, we just didn't have that, that uh, situation. Uh, in terms of why it has to be in the city limits, um, 
Commissioner Reddy touched on it briefly in terms of fire and police. Uh, they, this company, is, as you remember, is investing um, six, seven hundred million dollars in a facility and equipment. Uh, there will be um, probably nine digit of value worth of product in the facility at any given time. And it's incredibly important that they have professional fire and police protection as they go for uh, government contracts or other customers. But quite frankly, it, it might be impossible to even get insured without uh, city fire protection. And so um, they have stated, and we believe that th this is the case, that this project won't happen if it's not located within the city limits. So for that very reason, um, and, and we obviously are very supportive of this project. And so we would ask that you all start this process uh, of annexation. We believe the timeliness of it is incredibly important. Um, any delay in the process at this point, I think, puts risk into the entire uh, endeavor. And, um, and, and we just, we are very um, uh, appreciative of, of them being willing to stick with us as we go through this. But uh, we are here to answer any questions that you all might have um, going forward and, and uh, look forward to continuing the dialogue. Questions from the commission of Jason? Okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Mark Bashamp with Olson, and I'm agent, uh, working with agent for MCM uh, for this uh, industrial park. And Rich Shimon is here with MCM representing uh, their organization. So if you have any questions for Rich, but I uh, just want to say that we're excited about the project and, and there has been a lot of work to get ready and, and there's still a lot of work to be submitted in order to get this uh, site ready. And uh, I know we're looking forward to the annexation process and getting it through to the next step. So thank you. Thank you, Mark. Are there comments from any other um, folks here in the room? Okay, thank, thank you very much. I'll close the public comment period. Um, and uh, commissioners, I think you've had the opportunity to ask questions. Let me see what's next here. Um, so now the commissioners, uh, it's, it, we're ready for a motion. Well, Mayor, I move that we approve resolution number 62122-A finding that the annexation of the MCM Industrial Park pursuant to KSA 12520C is advisable based on the information in the staff report and requesting the Board of County Commissioners of Pottawatomie County find and determine that the proposed annexation will not hinder or prevent the proper growth and development of the area or that of any other incorporated city located within the county. I'll second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Are there any uh, last minute comments? Yes, uh, oh, sorry. I just wanted to say, I think uh, it is a huge partnership uh, between Pottawatomie County and the city of Manhattan, as well as the state. But I think uh, in the long run, uh, although we are, we have to provide fire as well as uh, RCPD services within that community, the, um, it adds more innovation to our community as well as the economic benefit and uh, the revenue that would come from Scorpion as well as the employment and hundreds of jobs will probably uh, balance that out. So it'll be, uh, I feel, a win-win in the long run for both communities and for the business sector as well. Thank you, Yusha. And I just want to say that I'm, uh, I support the annexation. I think it is a, um, will be an economic uh, partnership that will really pay off in time to come. And this is just kicking it off and getting it started. It just, we just took the first step in April. And so this is uh, a way we go with, as Jason Smith said, with the sequence of events that have to happen to make this uh, possible. So uh, Brenda Wolf, city clerk, would you call the roll? Commissioner Reddy? Yes. Commissioner Butler? Yes. Commissioner Mata? Yes. Mayor Morse? Yes. Commissioner Hassel? Yes. Motion carries five to zero. Okay. Uh, the next item on, thank you all for coming. If, and uh, the next item on the agenda is to consider the first reading of an ordinance adding tobacco shop and e-cigarette shop to the list of exempt exemptions 
to the, to the prohib prohibition on smoking and use of e-cigarettes. Jared Wassinger. Thank you, Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, I'm going to go over a little bit of a history uh, before I dive into the draft ordinance that is for you, uh, before you for consideration for first reading tonight. Um, back in 2008, the city went through a petition referendum process uh, that uh, an ordinance was presented to the citizens of Manhattan for a vote uh, in the general election in 2008 that would prohibit uh, basically smoking in public places and places of employment. This actually occurred prior to the Kansas Indoor Clean Air Act that was passed by the state. So that did pass uh, during that election and went into effect in January 2009. Uh, based on that petition referendum uh, statute, uh, the ordinance could not be amended or repealed for 10 years. Uh, July 1, 2010, uh, the state of Kansas did pass the Kansas Indoor Clean Air Act. There were uh, a few differences between the local ordinance that we had and the Kansas Indoor Clean Air Act. Uh, most of the differences with our ordinance at the time, they were a little bit more restrictive than the state in some areas. Uh, flash forward uh, to 2016, uh, the use of e-cigarettes became more prevalent and the city commission adopted a separate ordinance. Uh, because we couldn't amend or repeal the, the, the smoking ordinance that was passed by the citizens prohibiting the use of e-cigarettes. Flash forward a few more years, uh, passing that January uh, 2019 date where it had been 10 years, uh, the Flint Hills Wellness Coalition requested the city commission combine the two ordinances and make some changes, so we uh, went through a public process, talked through it a little bit, talked with the city commission, uh, had a few work sessions, and then uh, the city commission ended up repealing the 2009 and the 2016 ordinance and combining the two related to both uh, smoking and vaping. One particular area of the ordinance related to smoking within retail tobacco or uh, retail e-cigarette or vaping stores. Um, to our knowledge at the time, uh, back in 2008, uh, the ordinance that was passed by the citizens actually prohibited smoking in retail tobacco stores. The 2010 Kansas Indoor Clean Air Act actually exempted retail tobacco stores based on a defined definition. Uh, so for that 10 year period, uh, here in Manhattan, uh, people couldn't smoke tobacco in, in retail tobacco stores. There, there, there was, uh, to our knowledge, about one in existence at the time. In 2016, when we adopted the separate e-cigarette ordinance, we did actually mirror uh, closer to the state law. There were about three uh, e-cigarette stores in existence at the time. And in 2016, we did exempt uh, vaping within uh, e-cigarette shops. In 2019, when we combined the two ordinances, there was a majority of the city commission at that time that was in favor of prohibiting the use in both the retail stores. And that is how the ordinance is set forth today. So uh, this January in 2022, uh, during a city commission meeting, we received public comment from a citizen in support of exempting tobacco shops uh, from the ordinance that we have today, uh, more consistent with uh, state law. Uh, and then at that time, a majority of the city commission expressed a desire uh, to city administration to add that exemption for retail tobacco and e-cigarette shops in the ordinance. So. Uh, our legal staff drafted a, um, an ordinance for your consideration tonight. It does a couple things. One, it adds some definitions to the ordinance that were not there prior. We did not define tobacco shops or e-cigarette shops in the prior ordinance that was combined in 2019 because there was no need, because they weren't uh, exempted. So we defined tobacco shops, which is consistent with the state law, Kansas Clean, uh, Indoor Clean Air Act. Uh, and that definition is there before you. But basically, 65% um, of its gross receipts in that retail store or more have to be from the sale of tobacco for it to be determined as a, a tobacco shop. We also define e-cigarette shop. Uh, and we mirrored the definition for that with state law because currently state law does not define it and does not uh, regulate it in that way. Uh, so we just uh, mirrored the, the state law and provided uh, the same definition we actually uh, utilized uh, you know, the definition of e-cigarettes and those types of products that are, are in the ordinance and then defined it 
uh, with the e-cigarette shop. Same thing, 65% uh, of gross receipts uh, based off of those types of products have to occur for it to be defined as an e-cigarette shop. And then we, we have an exemptions uh, provision uh, section within the ordinance today, so we're adding uh, two um, areas where it would be exempted and you would be allowed to possibly smoke or vape in those areas. So we exempt tobacco shops and we uh, provide some definitions in there that essentially says that you can allow sm smoking uh, or the use of e-cigarettes in a tobacco shop if that uh, retail store does not share any enclosed common space or ventilation system uh, that would comprise uh, the rights of non-smokers and non-users in the area. We do the same thing for uh, e-cigarette shops with the exception that with an e-cigarette shop you can only use e-cigarettes in an e-cigarette shop. You cannot go into an e-cigarette store and smoke tobacco because that would be actually uh, against the, the state law because those are not exempted so we can't be less restrictive than the state law and the state law doesn't uh, define that there so same definition there uh, if, if it is an e-cigarette shop it can't uh, share an enclosed common space or ventilation system uh, that would comprise the rights of uh, non-users of e-cigarettes and I should should remove that non-smoker uh, portion right there any questions related to the, the definitions or the, um, the exemptions that are there? I have one question. How do you uh, determine or prove the, uh, how does the applicant prove the 65% threshold? So as the ordinance is written, there is no application process. Uh, they would, the store would make that determination. Uh -huh in the event, and I, I did talk with our uh, Manhattan Fire Department and risk reduction, so in, in the event that someone may challenge, uh, say for example, uh, a shared ventilation system occurred, the yeah. risk reduction would be looking into the, the plans and the yeah. HVAC that you was set up within that those plans. Based yeah. on the physical, uh, arra physical. Yep, yeah, they would but review that. I'm thinking that about case. the 65% threshold for uh, overall business. Yeah, that would again be based on... So do they ever have to sh prove that to you? They just say that? How does that work? That would be based off of uh, the, the business owner. Uh, so in the event it's challenged, yeah, they would somehow, we would have to figure out a way somehow to, to prove that the sale of, of their products is 65% uh, of those types of items, mm -hmm. which... Uh, you could do in probably a couple of different ways. I mean, if it was really close, you would have to, that business owner would have to make some determination and show some proof. That well, the that city was would occurring. be, it would need to enforce their rule or not, is what I'm asking. Yeah. How do you get there? Uh, so, okay. So you don't have a way, is what you're saying. There is, the city's not building a process into this. <clears throat> They're not building a process okay. into it, and we didn't find cities in Kansas that had uh, the state also doesn't uh, the state which allows retail tobacco stores uh, to smoking to occur in there yeah, they don't okay. have a process that um, checks that either that's the answer All right, well, thank well you. The answer. knowing that uh, that there's a chance they could be audited for that number I would assume the store owner is going to keep track somehow because they are at that so whether it's their computer system when they check people out I would assume they're going to want to know that number and keep track of it somehow in case they do get audited by somebody. But if some, it's like, like everything, until somebody makes a complaint and then they investigate it, it's, it's uh, on your honor Boy Scout. Yep. And that, that's how it was uh, in 2016 when we passed the e-cigarette ordinance here locally. It was kind of on that honor system. Yeah. Wasn't there, is there something now, or wasn't there something before about food and alcohol sales? And how did, yeah. how was that figured out? True. 30% of your... Used to be. Yeah. It doesn't exist anymore. But so many sales had to come from food. Right. When that was in place, was there a mechanism, or how did we do it, or... Yeah, I think that was actually more in, in line with the state. 
I don't think that was a, absolutely a local KD. Do you recall? Yeah, that's that was a state definition of tavern, and they and it was a county regulation. And so, if they had a complaint, then you could investigate whether or not someone complied with it. And it's, I mean, it's been repealed for ten years at least. So I was just thinking, if we do it the same way, if someone complained, then we could ask the operator to provide their records, and then we could see whether they had the percent or not. I think in most cases, you know, if you go in these vape shops, you can see that that's all they're selling. I think this would only this would only come up if you know somebody put a hot dog stand in there or something, and and then you know you'd have to look at that. I just don't see that happening. But you know, we cross that bridge when it when it happens. The the other question I have is that this is interesting the way this is written. If 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 somebody decides to call themselves a tobacco shop, they could sell tobacco products and e-cigarettes and they could smoke in that shop. But if you called yourself an e-cigarette shop, you could not sell tobacco products. Is, is that correct? It's not the sale, it's the use that we uh, are, are talking about here. So we are exempting these shops from the use in these areas. So if you had a tobacco shop, mm -hmm. and, you sold, and based on that definition, 65% or more of your sales are those tobacco-related products a user could smoke or vape in that establishment. If you were in the e-cigarette shop and you met that definition, you could vape in that shop. You couldn't smoke. So you're okay, saying but both of them could sell both tobacco and e-cigarette products if they wanted. But you still have to sell 65% of your sales has to be tobacco. 33% could be vape, but 36% could not be vape or e-cigarettes. More or less. What, what happens yeah. if somebody gets slick and says, "This is my, this is Win Butler's tobacco and e-cigarette shop"? They would still have to meet. It, again, it, it depends on them meeting the definition of the ordinance. So they would have to meet one of the two definitions of the ordinance for them to allow. All right, I can for them to me. be able to meet that exemption and allow their users or patrons to smoke or vape. Okay, got it. Thanks. Okay, are there <clears throat> other questions? All right. All right, at this point, um, we would um, receive pub be open to receiving public comment on this item. Uh, if you'd come up, up, you have sign in, <laughs> your name and address, and you would have five minutes. Okay. I won't read the big long paragraph because mm -hmm. there aren't many people here. Well, I'm Dr. Gardner. I'm retired from private practice. I did a lot of practice with people that had lung disease and such. And I remember all of these little steps with this ordinance. I can't understand where it came to a need to change that ordinance at this time. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't think the city. Uh, bureaucracy would do that without something coming to them and saying, well, we want to do this. Some of these issues were discussed in the past when the, there's been an issue. Why do we have the ordinance? Well, the ordinance has had some impact and the purpose of the ordinance not to smoke is for secondhand smoke and to help people get rid of tobacco. There's nothing really that is helpful to, you can't argue, argue that people need tobacco. You can argue a little bit that they need nicotine in their process of getting rid of these things. Uh, I was just recently, uh, yesterday, uh, I guess we had the Tobacco Free Kansas meeting and they're having their efforts to combat some of the things that are going on in the tobacco industry. I don't know why it wouldn't just leave the ordinance as it is. Maybe it's a little bit stronger than the state ordinance. Well, in my book, it's a little bit better. And in terms of the rights of an individual to smoke in the smoking store, uh, 
if you make an exception for that specific entity, what about all the other entities? You've got secondhand smoke in the smoking store if you go in and do it. So it's just adding to the situation. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it may, may be adding to the individuals that decide they want to smoke in the, in the smoking facility rather than go outside where they have to do it otherwise. So I think in my mind there's good psychological benefit to kind of leave the ordinance as it is. Uh, I don't know why we'd want to do something specifically to come within the state. Uh, I don't know that, I know there could be some statewide money coming down to <laughs> some people to try to get some of these things done. That's what actually happened in the past is tobacco industry uh, would play a role in some of these things. So anyway, I'm just giving my two cents worth. I sent the thing in. I didn't think I could make it there tonight because the barbershop course is supposed to sing a week, a block or two away from here. And the weather changed, so <laughs> they didn't sing so I could come over. So if there are any questions of me? Uh, just other than to say, I remember the room being full of people and you were one of the folks mm. discussing the uh, need for a tobacco, a banning tobacco uh, products in public places. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, that was years ago and I remember the election we had that's, that caused the, the risk, you know, just the prohibition here. And it was uh, the, the, the voters um, passed it. It wasn't just one citizen coming to this group and saying, this is what I want you to do. This was the voters in our community that were speaking uh, with their vote. So, appreciate you coming tonight. I think uh, yeah. a pulmonary doctor is important I'm, to hear from. I'm 79, so I've been through a lot of this. <laughs> <laughs> Multiple times. Yes. <laughs> thank you. appreciate you keep, that you keep coming. Thank you. Are there others that wish to speak this evening? Hi, good evening. I'm Kevin Crawford, and I am the January 18th person on the slide <laughs> who came to speak to City Council. I, uh, I do not work for the tobacco industry. I um, am just a private citizen who is a cigar smoker. And in the winter time, when it's 30 degrees, like it was back in January, it's difficult to sit outside and have a cigar. And I'll tell you, uh, I'm taking a trip back and forth to Topeka, uh, driving up and down the icy highway, if you will, uh, if that could be more dangerous. I, um, <clears throat> I guess I feel I don't really need a reason. I'm an American citizen, I pay my taxes, I served in the military, and I'm a cigar smoker. It's a perfectly legal product, and I'm not asking to be able to smoke it around people that don't smoke. I would like to see it be legalized in tobacco shops or an e-cigarette shop. I don't smoke e-cigarettes, I don't know the lingo. But, but I would like to have the ability to sit down and enjoy a cigar. For me, it's a relaxing piece. I understand about the pulmonary issues. I have heart disease. I do dialysis three days a week. I've got one foot in the grave, one on a banana peel, and I'm held together by the love of Jesus and uh, modern medical science. And so, I guess I take a little umbrage when I'm told I can't smoke because it's not good for me. I think I'm in a position where I can decide what's best for me. And as I've said before, what happens when we elect a city council or we have a group of people that say donuts should be made illegal because they're poison or sodas should not be allowed to be sold in 32 ounces because it's poison. 
at what point in time does the city hands off and let people live their lives. And people that don't smoke typically don't go into tobacco shops or e-cigarette shops. Typically people that are there are there so they can get cigarettes or cigars or whatever they smoke, hopefully at a discounted price. So they are probably already smokers. Most non-smokers would not want to go, I'm bleeding, would not want to go to work at a cigar or cigarette shop. So I think the point is kind of mute. The people that put themselves in harm's way are the people that would do it anyway. And I don't think, with all due respect, it's up to the city council to tell me how I should live my life. And I mean that with all due respect, but I, uh, I think that, I think I've probably said enough. So thank you. Okay. Hello. Yeah, oh. Another person. I just saw it on the agenda and I thought, uh -huh. well, this interests me. So Mark Bashamp, and I got one vice, uh -huh. is smoke cigars. And it started during COVID, and a group of a group of guys were sitting around, and we don't get we didn't get together, and and so we met out in my shed, and we smoked cigars and drank some bourbon, and it just reminds me of the of the uh, of what we do out at the, at the bourbon club once in a while, and if you've been. Uh, when you're going to conferences and doing different things, there's just different groups of people, men, women, I've had 50-50, and you go to cigar bars, and that's what they are. They are strictly a cigar bar. And you buy your cigar there, it's all ventilated, you got a bunch of TVs, you sit around and talk, and you have great conversation. There's one down in Wichita that plays live music every single night starting at eight o'clock. And it is a, a great venue. I think it's what a great opportunity for an entrepreneur to set up a cigar bar here in Manhattan. It would go very well because there's a lot of cigar smokers in this community that right now do not have a place to go. Uh, for example, we, I mean, a month ago we met out at Colbert Hills and had a cigar group of us out in the back. You know, the other day we went to Paracat. There is literally no place else you can go outside and 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 have a cigar. So. My daughter's a family physician. My youngest son's an anesthesiologist. So yes, I've got the family background, but you know, I got the vice that you know we get together and we chat, and we we discuss uh, a lot of things uh, around the different communities that you go and that are all like-minded and and want to have a cigar. So anyway, I had no plan to talk. It caught my eye, so I just wanted to give my piece. So. Okay. Is there anyone else that wishes to speak this evening? Okay. Um, we are to the point of our, is there a commission discussion? Um, commissioners have the opportunity to ask further questions of staff or discuss the item and uh, then we will have a motion. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to say I, I agree. I think we do have a good ordinance in place. Um, this certainly doesn't restrict anybody from uh, smoking or vaping or smoking a cigar uh, in their public private, pri private properties or in other establishments. But in the city of Manhattan, voters did make a decision. We were one of the first communities to have that um, not have smoking in public places or in bars and restaurants and such. And it had a huge impact on our businesses. Families were having dinner and doing things. There used to be a time when you can smoke on one side and not smoke on the other, and that never worked. But this worked really well for our community. And then we had lengthy discussions about e-cigarettes. And again, we um, went through an entire process and that benefited the city as well. So I don't see a reason to change it at this point, even though there are 
the ordinance has it where it's uh, you know detached or the HVAC is detached from other establishments and there's a 65% sales and all of these things. Uh, the exemption alone uh, makes us go a step backward when I think about wellness and healthness for the community. In your own private sphere, you're welcome to smoke and do whatever it is you, you would like and enjoy, and we're not restic restricting any of that. But as far as our, our community is, I think we've made a, a really good decision uh, on the ordinance that we have in place, and uh, I, I'm probably going to stick to that one. And um, I, too, think that our ordinance is rock solid. Um, you know, the business about the city not uh, p p uh, dictating, the state legislature has dictated. Ours is just a little bit different, and it was based on the voters, the will of the voters in this community. And I don't feel an obligation to make a change. I, I feel like this is the first foot in the door of more changes to come, and it'll just be a gradual eroding of the, some of the provisions that we have, I think you can go outside the, count, the city boundary and you can set up a shop, but nobody has. We had a lot of traffic on 24. Nobody has set up a, a, a cigar bar or a city, a uh, uh, e-cig or a, or a tobacco place. So I don't, I want to, us to be a healthy community and I think we set the standard by voting uh, and just because it expired after 10 years, we could probably do another campaign and get it to back again, especially if it becomes too onerous and uh, um, we keep chipping away at these little pieces to make it, uh, we, know, we remember what it was like in a restaurant where the people at the table, your table and the table next to you were smoking. And so I, I'm going to oppose this. I think that it's a step, I agree with you, Yusha, I think it's a step backwards. And uh, so um, other commissioners, please, your comments. Yeah, I'll make a couple of, you know, to me this is clearly government overreach. I mean, I, I understand the health thing. I, I'm not a smoker, I don't smoke cigars, cigarettes, won't go near a vape shop. That's just never been my thing and never will do it. But. That aside, you know, I think uh, the case has been well made that uh, why do you want to over-restrict how somebody lives? You know, and, and, and if, you know, the city wants to vote to say that. Why don't you just vote banning sale of cigarettes in, in the entire city for that matter? I know some people would like that. But, you know, prohibition doesn't work. I mean, I think that was proven. Prohibition doesn't work. So we got to let people do what they do, and, and, and it may kill them. But that's their choice, and, and that's how I've always felt. I, I believe, you know, it's a... It's a civil liberties issue, and I, I didn't have a problem w with the ordinance uh, when we combined it, you know, the e-cigarettes e and everything. I like it that people don't smoke in restaurants. I think all the smokers adapted to it, but last time we discussed this, you know, we wanted to go so far as to ban smoking on the golf course and on the patios, and as was said tonight, you know, some people go out and smoke on the patios. I have a number of friends that smoke. They leave the restaurant, go out on the patio. That's fine. You know, they, they, they do that. It's a little bit of an inconvenience, but I think everybody's got it. But, you know, letting a you know, cigar shop open or, you know, a vape shop open makes sense. You know, reality, what did, what did we do with those previous ordinances? We put a tobacco shop out of business. And, and the three vape shops in town that opened with the expectation that they could do vaping in there were also shut down, you know, to a certain extent. They're still selling it, so th that makes no sense. So in, in my mind, you know, I've got to support this because it's not going to do any harm. Uh, the people that are going to do this are going to do it anyway, and, and we put in a pr provision here where the HVAC si system's got to be separate, so it's not even close to the old system where restaurants had a smoking and non-smoking section. I mean, we've come way beyond that, so I'm going to vote in favor of it. I'll just comment, being someone who's um, had to deal with the smoking issue for a long time, I'm like, when I don't smoke cigarettes, cigars, or anything else, but you know, running a facility in an organization with over a thousand people with a lot of them who smoke um, and have to be there 8, 12, 16 hours a day, uh, you, you know, we came up with ways to make it so we could get people separated and the people who, you know, 
um, wanted to smoke could and got the others so they wouldn't have to have the secondhand smoke. And we spent money to make it so that we could have it that way, so we could take care of all of our employees. And the thing with the smoking, you know, unlike the soft drinks or the donuts, it's really the effect of the person who doesn't smoke. I mean, that was the point of all this, was to protect them. And I think what we're doing in here does protect them because uh, it's only in the smoke shops. As has been said, people who go into the smoke shop are people who smoke. Now, I've gotten emails that said, well, what if someone's buying a present for somebody and they have to go in? And it's like, well, they could do curbside pickup if they really want to. And then it was like, well, what about the employees? I think a lot of these probably have the owners in there running the shops for the most part. And I think most employees uh, probably smoke or vape themselves. Uh, right now, I don't think that's an issue at all because we have a hard enough time getting people just to fill jobs. So I don't think anyone's forced to work in a vape shop, but employment could change and maybe they could. But I really don't think that's a big issue. I think what we've come up with really separates it to only the people who want to be in there will be in there. The issue is secondhand smoke. I think we've taken care of that issue. You can always make a slippery slope argument that uh, then it's going to be another thing and another thing. And I think if that were to happen, you probably would get people together and do another petition to get rid of it if we were to do that. But for something like we're proposing, I think it's a common sense thing that you know really takes care of everybody. And the people who smoke, they know what their risks are, and that's their decision. There's nothing much to add here, but I think that the ordinance is still going to be rock solid because nobody who doesn't want to be exposed to secondhand smoke will be exposed to secondhand smoke still. It's just a matter of uh, if you, yeah, if you if you go into a smoke shop or a vape shop, you know where you're going, and if you don't know it when you walk in, you will the second after you walk in. And so I'm not overly concerned that uh, that there anyone goes to stuff that they aren't expecting or are willing to do there. So. Um, yeah, and, and not doing, yeah, not passing it isn't going to make the city any healthier either. And so, and I, don't, I, I would argue that it's not going to change anything really other than um, we might, in the wintertime, if, if some place actually opens or provides this service at some point. Um, I, I smoke half a dozen cigars a year, usually when I'm playing golf, occasionally when I'm uh, riding my tractor out in the country or something. But it's, it's a matter of... Uh, um, for me, it's it's that kind of government overreach, and this is just just a little bit of pushback to balance that out and grant just a little bit of, of freedom and autonomy um, back to people that have really gotten uh, uh, pushed pushed around a lot over the last 20 years. And so I understand. Yeah, no one's going to be hurt by it, and maybe somebody will uh, come up with a bright idea, and it'll be a new hot spot that brings people to town somehow. Okay, well, I'd like to go ahead and make a motion that we approve first reading of an ordinance adding tobacco shop and e-cigarette shop to the list of exemptions to the prohibition on smoking and use of e-cigarettes. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion on the motion? Okay, seeing none, uh, Brenda Wolf, would, City Clerk, would you call the roll? Commissioner Butler. Yes. Commissioner Mata? Yes. Mayor Morris? No. Commissioner Hedesall? Yes. Commissioner Reddy? No. Motion carries three to two. Okay, the next item on the agenda, let me find it here, it gets long, is uh, D, item D, to consider a resolution relating to the governing body meeting procedures, <clears throat> and Katie Jackson, the city attorney, will uh, present. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. This item, um, I don't have a PowerPoint. We just covered, went through this draft at the last meeting. <clears throat> um, I think up on the screen, can't quite see it, there's the changes that were made at the recommendation of the commission. For tonight, just as a reminder, um, if this is the policy manual resolution that will be implemented to help effectuate the changes you've already made to the Chapter 2 administration chapter and then the upcoming 
um, charter ordinances being effective on June 30th. So this is designed to go into a place on June 30th to coincide with those ordinances, um, to correspond to those changes, and to elaborate on some of the procedural things that we've discussed in the past. The list is up there. Um, the only thing I would note that we didn't talk about was um, there is a sentence added in section C6D that talks about an abstention will be counted with the prevailing side um, only on non-ordinance matters. So this is in, so the prior version said that um, as required by state law that any ordinance has to be voted in by affirmative votes of at least three but the law for non-ordinance matters is, pardon, let me go back a step. So affirmative votes of three, so an abstention does not count with the prevailing side. It has to be a true affirmative vote. The law for non-ordinance matters is that an abstention be counted with the prevailing side. It's the Kansas common law. It has been the law, and it's in the league's code of procedure. I added it just for clarification. One thing for everyone to keep in mind is it says prevailing side, so it doesn't break a tie, because in a tie, there is no prevailing side. I've already talked to the city clerk, Brenda Wolf, about the minor change we would need to make, which is in our minutes, we would, if someone abstains, let's say the vote is 3-1-1, one being an abstention, it could be noted that this commissioner abstained, but the final vote would be 4-1. So, but we'd put in our minutes, this commissioner abstained, that abstention counts with the prevailing side. So it's be, it'd be properly recorded. Um, it really isn't a huge impact, but it's something that will be helpful to have clarified if that issue arises. Other than that, um, there are no surprises or anything much different about this from the prior draft. And so I'll just turn it over to any commission questions that you may have. I do have a question about a conflict of interest. If a commissioner says they have a conflict of interest, then is that an abstention or do they leave the room and just don't vote? So by doing that, then that their abstention uh, counts uh, for the motion is what your prevailing side. For the prevailing side. <clears throat> so when a commissioner abstains for a true conflict of interest, we have advised, they're not required to leave the room. We've advised in the past that it's wise to leave the room so that you don't have any nonverbal influence over the matter, so you're not accused of that, anything like that. So typically our commissioners do choose to leave the room, so they won't vote. It's a true abstention. Whether they're in the room or not, if there is a prevailing side on that matter, um, their vote would be counted, as I indicated, um, with the prevailing side. If there's a tie, it would the whatever the item was, it would fail. And again, we're only talking about non-ordinances. This cannot apply by state statute to ordinances or charter ordinances. So, so to give an example of that, because I've abstained a few times because my sister's husband bids on city contracts. So if I abstain from it, and it, it would, would be, be one yes abstention vote. and four mm -hmm. yes, the final result would be five yeah. because my abstention would go with the prevailing group. That's right. And okay, we, I and, got it. And like I said, the, the clerk has, we've talked about noting that so that it is accurately reflected, Commissioner, that you did abstain for a conflict of interest, so we have that properly noted. So just because I think it's a fun question, if we had a meeting, we only had our quorum of three, and two of the commissioners were officers of a company for a contract, so they abstain, and it passed one zero, or one person voted yes, then that would be counted as three. If, so, assuming this is a non-ordinance matter. Right? Non-ordinance matter. <laughs> okay, let's make sure we're you clear said it was on a contract. Yeah, I, I wanted to be sure we were all on the same page there. Then in that case, then that one person's vote can carry. We hope that doesn't happen, but it is true. Once you have a quorum, you could have an abstention and then Right, that but it would be recorded as three vote. zero in that. It would be, but with the with the qualifier we talked about for the right, vote. exactly. Okay. So I think it has unintended consequences. Right. So <clears throat> if that is, uh, you said that's the state statute, right? So that's the Kansas common law, which means it's been established by the Kansas Supreme Court. It is not something the city of Manhattan can change. Um, it has to be changed by statute or different case law. Um, that's why it is in the um, leagues book they put it in their governing body manual in two different places and I reached out in other cities not every city has it specifically noted but many of them do um, mm -hmm. so that there is just to prevent the confusion at the night if there's an abstention it just helps everyone understand what yeah. happens typically it, I mean in the past that hasn't been the case we had cases where we would say a certain commissioner oh, abstained and we still had the vote it didn't go one way or the other oh, I think but the uh, uh, does the state do it the same way or at the federal level when they take a vote, it's clear when some legislators abstain, so it doesn't count either way. 
I, Commissioner, I can't speak to okay. the state or federal rules. It probably depends upon the agency and their sure. own rules. This is the procedure for governing bodies. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable with it because uh, I think people abstain for a certain reason, and uh, it shows as though, for example, as Commissioner Butler stated, that he was, if he goes with the prevailing vote of 5-0 when he had to abstain because of a conflict of interest, nobody's going to read <clears throat> the rest of the stuff that he did abstain or there was a conflict of interest or anything like that, I would, um, it just muddies it up a little bit where it was, it seems like it was simpler before uh, and people would say I abstain because I have a conflict of interest and their vote didn't count for anything, yeah. which makes it neutral it, and appropriate. We aren't making a change. This has been the law for decades. It's no. just not something right. that we have noted probably the way that right. we, we have but, but frankly, it hasn't had a negative impact on us other than from a recording purpose for our minutes that we would have reflected the votes as I indicated. Since it can't break a tie, it wouldn't have influenced the outcome because in a tie there's not a prevailing side. So it's really something just to be sure that we're complying with the law and noting in our minutes appropriately. So I, I, under, I understand your comments, but it's not something, even if we don't put it in this policy, we should still change and follow that law. So we have to say yes or no most of the time then, I think. To, if you yeah if you instead of abstaining because there are times we may just didn't want to take a position uh, so so this there's also a duty to vote and so if somebody doesn't have a true conflict of interest then they should be voting on the item it should be taking a position and voting so and that duty to vote is also incorporated in your procedure manual and league's materials mm -hmm. so this is abstention should only occur for a true conflict of interest it shouldn't be just to not take a position on an item so I think the thing that comes to me closest is when we did the DEI task force I think there were like three yeses one no and one abstaining and that reflect that was reflected in the record but this time it would have gone to where that abstention would have gone with the majority okay just wanted to clarify uh, I do I so on bullet point three, uh, the motion to call to question can be made at any time after a motion is made consistent with typical practice. We did discuss this a little bit, but I still feel uncomfortable if somebody, you know, if we had the presentation and somebody made a motion, almost, yeah, and then we, there's no space here for to make sure that all commissioners have commented. Uh, I feel like if it's not written, it's not it won't be done. It's assumed that commissioners made their comments ahead of time. <clears throat> but we don't know that. If, if this is the case, then future commissioners, or even us, we might make a motion and a second is made, or a uh, motion to call to question is done, a uh, second is called, and then it moves on to a vote, whether there's commissioners' comments or not. And um, again, I request that we insert after all commissioners have spoken to the issue. Or, or something to that effect. Have the opportunity to speak. Yeah. <coughs> and, and, and you're right, we did discuss that. We said it was because of the cumbersomeness of making that determination uh, in the example of the, the one meeting we had to judge whether people had spoken or not. I think the key is it takes a majority of the commission to enact that. So uh, I don't think you're going to get a majority of the commission to all vote to do it by one motion, one second, call the question type of thing. I don't think that's going to, you're going to, I can get a majority commission uh, to do that. As it says in there, it should be rarely used. It should be when things are just going around and around and it's finally like, you know, we're not getting anywhere and we just need to have a vote on it. Because, and again, it takes the majority of the commission just to make that happen. Yeah, this is the discussion we're having now. The future commissioners are not going to read into it like we are. If and the says, other is yeah. cutting the meeting short because there's a storm coming. Right. And Mark is getting really antsy. <laughs> so I, 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 I'll probably, I don't know if I can vote just one no on a bullet point, but I would like it to be inserted that there is uh, at least room for commissioner comments even after the call to question is made to make sure that everybody has had their um, comments in there. Well, despite the cantankerousness that we sometimes get into, I think for the most part, everybody's willing to hear everybody out for the first 30 minutes or so. <laughs> and at some point, you know, like we said the other day, it's like if two people are just trying to get the other one to change their mind and we know it's not going to happen, that's when somebody else says, 
time out. We're, we're done here. Let's call the question and get on with it because nobody's changing anybody's minds. I, I think decorum sort of acceptable behavior of city commissioners is going to allow people to get a chance to weigh in on stuff. And, and if somebody starts being a real, to use the medical term, anus about the thing, it's just, there's, there's I don't think that's ever going to happen simply because on the big scheme of things, we're all fairly nice people who want to try to make things happen here. And it's just this never ending going around and around that is that what this is decided is is being based on and I just don't think we're we it's never happened in three and three years or two and a half years this time amongst us despite the differences we have on things and so I think I, I John think. cut me off and stopped the meeting at a recent meeting uh, when I was speaking about and talking about my position on something and I don't think I talked as long as Wim does I, I'm just saying there are uh, I'm uh, not going to speak last anymore, so I'm not interrupted in the future. Uh, as mayor, I can make that decision about what order we go in. I can compensate for that behavior. So I'm just saying there are ways to deal with things, but the, at cutting another commissioner off in the middle of a, uh, at, at, I do not talk too long most of the time. So I don't think that's an issue. So anyway, yeah. I'm just saying I'm going to vote no on this also. And then the general advice is to motion to call to question you sparingly. Sparingly, I don't know what that means, and this is just a footnote for us, uh, you know, to use it sparingly. But I, you know, I, I feel uncomfortable with, this, with the entire bullet three. So I don't know if we can just vote no on a specific bullet or if we vote yes, if we have to vote for all of it or no means to all of it. Commissioner, it depends on the motion that's made. So if a motion is made to adopt the resolution, then that's the vote that would occur. If a motion is made to adopt it with something changed, then that's the motion that everyone would vote on. Okay. So I move, uh, let me see. Where is it now the commissioners ask? Where, um, what am I missing here? Where's the motion? <laughs> there's no, there's no motion. It's on page 13. Oh, okay. Uh, I move to approve policy manual resolution number 062122-B to repeal. Uh, well, I'm not exactly sure how to say that, to repeal it, but I would like to move forward with bullets number 1, 2, and, one, two, and three, 4 and remove the call to action statement. What page is it on your show? There, call to action is what I was looking oh, for. Yeah. Commissioner, if I may, if you want to, I think what you want to do is you want to add the statement. That would be, you would move to approve the resolution, excuse me, resolution with an addition to C5, um, Jay, to add that all commissioners have an opportunity to speak before um, the question can be called, which is what it said before. In other words, I believe what you're trying to construct is adding that sentence. Right. Mm -hmm. so, that, so you would make your motion that way to approve to add it to that section. Okay, let me try that again. I would like to add, because I don't have the resolution in front of me. Um, you want me to give it to you? You want to read it again for you? And then you could say yes. Yes, there's, I would like There's J right okay. there. <clears throat> okay. J, I would like to um, uh, add to the call to question to include. Um, I'm having a difficult time again. C5J. C5J to add. It says no further debate to make sure there is discussion after the motion has been made. Does that make sense? No. <laughs> Commissioner, you need to make a motion to approve the resolution. That motion is in your materials, so okay. that's, that's already there. And then at the end of it, you would say to add a sentence to section C5J 
who state that the um, question cannot be called until each commissioner has had a chance to comment on the motion. So thank you, Jared. That, I think that will help. It's highlighted, Commissioner. So you just, that's the motion to approve, and then you would add your addition to the end of that motion. Okay. Okay, so it's, okay, so. I move to approve policy resolution number, say that all, all of that, right? 06212-B to replace, uh, repeal and replace policy manual resolution uh, number 050115-B relating to government body procedures. Is that the second one? With an addition to C5J to add to call to motion, call to question, um, to add further discussion after a motion, after a call to question is called? To allow all commissioners to comment. To allow all commissioners to comment. After all commissioners have had the opportunity to comment, yeah. It's very difficult for me, but I hope that mm -hmm. made sense. Well, so you have made a motion. I, I will motion. second your motion. Is there discussion? No discussion. Okay. City Clerk, would you call the roll? Commissioner Mata? No. Mayor Morse? No. No what? Yes, yes yeah, I yeah. want it to pass. <laughs> Excuse me. Commissioner Hattisall? No. Commissioner Reddy? Yes, after all that. Commissioner Butler? No. Motion fails, two to three. I'd like Thank to you. make a motion. Go ahead. Approve policy manual resolution number 062122B to repay, repeal and replace manual resolution 050118-B relating to gov governing body procedures. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Um, is there further discussion? My further discussion, only comment I would have is to be disappointed that all commissioners are not extended the opportunity to make comment and can be cut off from doing that. So at this point, I... I wait, one second. I also, on the governing procedures, did we discuss any of that? Uh, we discussed no. the first resolution, but we didn't have any discussion on the second policy governing procedures mm -hmm. resolution. True. What one would you want to talk well, about? Katie, is there other stuff to present? I'm not sure which, are you talking about the second item listed as attachments on there, Commissioner? Right, for the procedures, because we're changing that's, the times. That's the revoking one. We haven't got yeah. to those yet, right? The, the so, changing the times and stuff. Yes, that you change the times in the ordinance. The attachments, the first one listed is the one that you uh, have a motion to approve tonight. The second one listed is the prior um, 2018 policy manual resolution that this second one will repeal and repealed. replace. And we have discussed the one that you're taking action on now. It's the one that we discussed and went through section by section at the last meeting. So I had questions on some of the procedures uh, as far as the timing, because we never set a time that we'll start at 6 o'clock. We set an end time. Is that part of this discussion or that's? You, you set the new start time in this, the ordinance that was adopted at second reading at the last meeting. So that was Separate set. ordinance. Yes. <clears throat> All right. Sure. Did you have any other questions? No? Any other commissioners? Everybody's had a chance. <laughs> okay. Um, we have a motion and a second. Are we ready to vote? All right. City Clerk Brenda Wolf, would you call the roll? Commissioner Mata? Yes. Mayor Morse? No. Commissioner Hassel? Yes. Commissioner Reddy? No. Commissioner Butler? Yes. Motion carries three to zero. Three to two. Okay. Just FYI, we aren't in a thunderstorm warning till nine o'clock. Uh, Sixty mile an hour winds and nickel size hail. Uh, it's uh, the leading edge is just southwest of the city, moving about thirty five miles an hour. Oh, I'm going. Okay. Uh, with at this point, we are adjourned. The mayor is declaring we are adjourned. <laughs> not waiting for a motion. <laughs> I'm not waiting for a motion. <laughs>